What, so you, you started telling me about your first mission. Where was your first well, mission? Well, the first mission was to Merceburg. And uh, so we had flak all the way down the, from the IP clear, clear down to the target. And uh, I think it, I'm pretty sure it was 57 planes that got shot down that day. And uh, they say we didn't get shot down, but we had, I think, 100 and, or 120 holes in the plane from little pieces, you know. And I say the one hit right in the windshield in front of me, but luckily it didn't go through. <laughs> so I still had that little piece. Well, I gave it to my grandson, <laughs> little piece of flak, that, a little piece of the shell there that lodged in the windshield. So did it just um, spider web it at all? Or it just... Yeah, went through the outer layer of it and then just banged up the inside some. And, so, uh, oh, that mission, I, yeah, that was a, the first mission. I was the only one of the squadron that got back to, the, to our own base. But... Uh, there was, that was the one where the lead plane and the two on its, on its wing and the one below all went up in one big ball of flame there. And you see the engines and the wheels and stuff falling out of it. But, and uh, that was quite a sight there. I remember my tail gunner, he had, <laughs> in the briefing, he had a, Big eyes like this, you was still seeing it, you know. <laughs> so that was your, and that was your first experience where it was active war, where they were firing back. And... Uh, that was my first first mission. Yeah, I, I said after that, I uh, thought, well, I'm not. They're all like this. I'm not going to last very long. But then I had a couple of kind of milk runs. I called them, you know, that went to places where we didn't have flak or or fighters. And, uh, and then <clears throat> because of the the lead and the deputy lead getting shot up or blown up there, they selected me to to be the lead, and so I went off of combat and into training for for a couple of months then. And and by the time I got back, then uh, we well, we uh, we didn't have anything like that Merceburg deal again. But we did lose some planes, but not too many. Do, do you remember if it was worse? You had that, okay, so you went and you saw what action was like, and then you had that training period. Do you remember if it was more difficult then because you actually knew what you were getting into? Or? Well, no, not really. Uh -uh. I was ready to go back. I flew about three or four missions then with as a lead pilot, but we were never the never the whole uh, lead of the whole thing. Uh, about every once in a while, your your group will be will lead the whole bomber stream, but that isn't very often. They just once in a while, and uh, so I was just leading the squadron, and and uh, is all, and. It, it, and uh, so you're back in the bomber stream. Then. Now again, you're flying all at the same elevation. Is that correct? All these thousand planes, or well, not they're up and down some. A little bit. Yeah. So like when you described, uh, but they're your first... basically at the same elevation, but they're maybe a you know a thousand or so feet difference on some of them. So when you. Uh, were in the the one where you talked about where you lost, uh, where you were the only one that made it back from your squadron and planes in front of you had been hit. Are you flying through their fireball or? We were we were up above that one, so we didn't go through it. But uh, it was down into here, and we were up like this. Could you hear? And you may not remember this long time. But, uh, could you hear a change? in your crew's tone that all of a sudden they realized, my goodness. Well, they said, my, yeah, well, I added some exclamations there. They said, look at that. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, it was, it was quite a sight. And uh, one of the fellows that was deputy lead there was 
in training with me in the States, and that was uh, one of his first missions too, I think. And he'd, uh, for some reason, he got over there a little bit before I did, and, and uh, so he was a little farther along. He'd flew in a, flown some other missions with me before, you know. So you you knew who it was then. Yeah. Right? And in fact, we were at his wedding in in uh, phase training. He got married down in Louisiana, and and just a few months later, he was he was gone. Who would have to notify his wife? Then? I mean, would somebody from the squadron write a letter home? To yeah. Him? Yeah, the squadron commander had, or the group commander had would write the letters, I think, or at least sign them, you know, and read them, I'm sure. Wow. Well, I, uh, again, it would be tough being a group commander, I think. A lot of responsibility, a lot of mm -hmm. both sides of everything. Yep. Does it... I hear basketball players talk about when they play basketball, they can slow the world down, and, and the game happens kind of in slow motion, so they're very in control, even though it's things are, Is it that way with pilots? I mean, when you're out there, are things happening fast, or are you so knowledgeable, not, I guess, so controlled that... Well, I don't know. I didn't notice that <coughs> thing slowing down especially, but you're just, you're just flying as you... you, you, you you fly kind of automatically, you know, and just do things automatically. Can you, and, do you have radio contact between other planes or just within your plane? No, other planes too, but you usually didn't, you usually maintain uh, radio silence. And so they didn't know just where you were, you know. So once you, you got in formation, then... There'd be a certain mark you would hit that you would cut radio off. Yeah, yeah after a while, we got over the continent, especially, and maintained silence. Is there a? But, to, oh. but you could speak on your intercoms. But we didn't do too much talking. I don't think, unless there was something coming up, you'd see see fighters off this way or or our our escorts. And then we were lucky when I was flying because we had escorts just about all the time. They wouldn't they wouldn't fly through the flak with us, but they'd they'd be there when we came out and then <laughs> escort us back and escort us to there. So and uh, and the Germans didn't uh, have enough petroleum, you know, enough fuel to send up fighters just all the time. So they'd. Uh, pick out stragglers for one thing they would, or, a, or, a, or a small group that would go to one target and leave the main bomber screen you know and go somewhere else and they'd pick on them but they but they didn't uh, they didn't just hit us all the time anyway because they just didn't have the fuel and that was why that Luna uh, synthetic oil thing was so important that they, they wanted to be sure they knocked that out so they didn't have fuel. And it produced a lot of the of the fuel that they used. And they, is that the one they had to do a number of runs into? Yeah, they did two or three times at least, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure. The one I was on, I think, was uh, was either the second or third time they'd been back there. Is there a smell when you're up there flying? I mean, I don't know. Does flak have a smell, or does? Well, no. They get your. I don't know. The engines have a smell, but they don't really get into the plane very much, you know. So you don't notice any smell in particular. So there's not anything in your average everyday life every so often that it's kind of like a, a, a Volkswagen Bug it has a very distinctive smell. Mm. Whenever I. Say, I that's a bug smell. Is there a, a plane smell that ever takes you back? To... No, not really. 
when, when you were talking. Oh. I haven't uh, flown much since the war, though. Uh, Few plane, few light planes I've flown, but uh, but I uh, went into boating instead of flying. I guess that kind of took the place of it. Uh, doing the same thing only at a slower speed. And when the engines go out, you don't fall out of the water. I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Where the it's interesting because you talked about the radio contact within the plane. You know, we see one coming there. We see one coming. The first time you got in flight, did your your Gunners go nuts. I was over at the tank range in, in um, uh, Yakima one time, and I got to listen in on the tank guys, and they were just training. It was the first time they'd ever been out. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, their crew went nuts. It went right, 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 right. You yeah. know, and they came back and <laughs> sit down, and they all went through it in the training and all that. By the time you get out there, is your crew so trained, or the first time that they started coming, is there that little yeah. extra? No, they just call it out if, it's, uh, if they see any any fighters around, you know, they'll call, call them out and say where they are. But uh, I say we were pretty lucky. We didn't get hit with fighters too much. So. How high do you, do you fly on a bombing run? Well, we were right around 30,000 feet most of the time. So from 30, what can you see? I mean, well, you can see a, you can see a lot. There are not real details, you know, but you can see towns and roads and Rivers and and a lot of a lot of things. Else. You can see a kind of factory complex or a railroad marshalling yard and things like that. You see. Well, and uh, we had uh, this started coming in with this uh, what we call it Mickey, but it was a a uh, where you could uh, see on the instruments, you know, through the clouds and and see the outline of things down below. And like the uh, stuff we have in boating now, you know. That, but it was pretty basic then, but it, it, it worked, I guess, you know. And a lot of times we were flying over uh, with cloud cover down below and we'd bomb through the clouds and, and hit pretty good, pretty good results, I think, with it too. So as they came up with new technology, where they come and say, "Hey guys, we got some new stuff for you here, and yeah. go test it out for us." Was that kind of how? Uh... Yeah, that was really the hot thing then. That uh, that Mickey it was kind of Loran, I guess it was, or something that you know, that they they could uh, pinpoint where you were anyway, you know. But you had to have the coordinates, I think, of where the thing was down there, you know, so you could bomb on that. Were you guys pretty successful in most of your bomb raids? Well, I think most of them we we hit pretty pretty well, you know. They're not like these smart bombs they have now, I guess, though. But and the laser-guided things, missiles and things like that, but... We did, uh, I think, <clears throat> with the, <clears throat> the 8th Air Force, we tried to hit specific targets, you know, and we just didn't carpet bomb, but the uh, English, they were doing going over at night, and they just dropped their bombs on the lead plane that go, the leader would go over and, uh, and uh, shoot off his flares and something everybody had drop in that area, you know, and they hit a lot of uh, houses and things like that, too. But, but uh, we tried to pinpoint our targets, anyway, and most of the time we hit pretty close to them, I think. Cause you, you said you, a lot of times, you're doing like 500-pound bombs. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, most of the time. How, about how many of those would you take on a flight? Oh, let's see. Be, uh, I think we carried about three tons of them, so... I'd, It was pretty good load, anyway. And generally, when the bombardier got this thought, bombs away, and it would just do 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 do, just. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they were loaded in the bomb racks, just, and they would start off dropping out. They they go the whole string of them down. And. Did you ever have any hangers? 
Well, once in a while they did. I, we never had any in ours, but then once in a while they would hang up then. You'd have to go and manually release it. At 30,000 feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a little catwalk in the middle of the <laughs> bomb rack, <laughs> bomb bay there, so you can <clears throat> you can stand on that and the things are right up alongside of you there. And, that makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want to make a misstep then. <laughs> huh. it, it's a... Um, so, and when you went down because of what, where you were focused, and plus when you dropped your bombs, they would have been hitting behind you somewhere. So mm -hmm. if you were to see any hitting the ground, it would have been from one of the planes in, in front. Well, you could... Uh, <clears throat> You'd probably you'd turn around one way or the other after your bomb thing, and you could look over and probably see where they hit. You know. When... Did you return in formation, or once you? And yeah, you'd turn in formation if you. And then, and then, as you flew back, it would be still in formation, and mm -hmm. everybody wouldn't just. Yeah, you'd be in formation if everything went all right, you know. But if something happened, you have to drop out. Then you were on your own. Um, think if I had any other. So ten hours? Did you, 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 you? There wasn't a stewardess up there. Did they yeah, give you? Had, yeah, you had a little sack lunch they gave you. You know, and uh, it was enough to keep you going. Fine. And it wasn't a gourmet meal exactly. <laughs> But you found enough time somewhere in the flight to actually be able to eat the lunch. Oh yeah, yeah. Most of the time you were just just flying there, you know. And, and when you're before you get like onto the bomb run, where you have to keep a tight formation, you were spread out some so you can fly pretty leisurely. <laughs> did Did you have an onboard camera? Um, I mean, is nothing, that uh, nothing that uh, official, you know. But they then the lead planes. They had cameras to mark, you know, what the what happened on it. And so that's generally who who would take the, because I assume when you came back they would analyze photos of yeah. whether you hit targets. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that would be the lead plane. Yeah. yeah I don't think the, every plane had it, but they're just maybe a few planes, probably a lead and maybe some others, but. But they didn't have it in all planes. Huh. So, like you were saying, getting there, a lot of it was just casual. And then there would be a certain point where, okay, battle stations or whatever. You go in, you do your bombing run, which would be, what, 15, 20 minutes out of that full 10-hour flight? Yeah, something maybe depending on where it was and what they were doing, but it uh, might be anywhere from five minutes to 10 or 15 minutes, I think. And a lot of, sometimes there wouldn't be any flack, but a lot of times there would be. And, and uh, when you get close to the main targets, they have an aircraft circling the whole thing there. So where, whatever angle you came in on, you'd be hitting some of the guns, you know. And I turn it, you flew during the day, right? Mm -hmm. The Brits flew at night. That yeah. was a big difference between the... Yeah. Yeah, I had round-the-clock bombing, so they were doing the night flying. And we did the day flying. The 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 runways back in uh, out of England where you're flying out of, were they grass runways? Or, no, or they were concrete. They were concrete. Yeah. It's just amazing to think of how many planes they had over there. And oh yeah, they were jammed in there pretty, pretty tight. <laughs> so when you, like you talked about your plane coming back from your first mission had a what do you say hundred holes in it? Yeah, something. something so what did they do to patch the holes? I just pop rivets and stuff on and. Yeah, a lot of them. Well, a lot of them they'll just patches put patches on there, and then whatever damaged inside they'll fix. You know. It, it takes a little 
upkeep on those things to keep them going. That's where those ground crews must have been amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they work all night on them sometimes, you know, to get ready for the next day. And yeah, they were like really, you... really devoted to getting the thing done. <laughs> and it wasn't like they could just go down to the local Home Depot to get parts a lot of times. I mean, no, they had they'd... some. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, they scrounged a lot of parts from planes that had come in and, uh, you know, and make it back to the field, but then they'd be so damaged that they really weren't where they could fly them again. And, and they'd uh, take parts off of those and, and uh, use them on the other planes. So was the, 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 the airfield just kind of a graveyard? I mean, you could see ones that had pretty well been... Well, no, they'd haul them off to the hangar somewhere, you know, and strip them down and use the parts. They had one field there that, uh, and I can't remember the name of it now, but it was down toward London somewhere there that if you were uh, really damaged, it could, and you could go and you could land any direction on that, just come in and land it, you know. And they had uh, fog dispersal stuff on it, which uh, that helped a lot of times too. They'd burn gasoline drums, I think, probably what they did, but try to disperse the fog on the, and that was another thing in the, there where the weather was in the winter time, it was really get a lot of fog, you know, and you'd come in sometimes there, they'd, uh, they'd had a, a beeper thing on the, out on the runway, and then we had an instrument on there that had a kind of a cross needles like this that if you kept them right, Crossed, you were on the flight path. If you were, went up, you were up above it and off to the side, you know. So, so you could go in on that. And then at the end of the runway, they had a couple of guys there shooting flares off. <laughs> so you went between those. <laughs> Well, you also described, so their fog dispersal, what was that? They basically just set some... I think probably they just had like gasoline drums, or gasoline burning or something, you know, their oil burning that the, makes them heat there to disperse the fog. But I think that's the only thing they had. But anyway, they would, so I guess it worked somewhat. <laughs> somewhat. But anyway, you could land on there so any way you wanted, just come in and put it down. <laughs> Because I assume, like you were describing, some of the situations you landed in were not ideal. Uh... Oh no, that was that was one of the big factors of flying over there. You had to do a lot of instrument flying, and we had a radio range right on our field there, that so which was really good. You could fly the range in, and then and then you knew the pattern to come around, and then by the time you got back, flew. And on the approach, then you had this thing here. You could you could fly. It'd take you the glide path down in there, and then to be sure, you went right through the flares. <laughs> so now, what was it? you said a radio range? What was that? that... It's a, a radio signal that goes out at an N and an A, and there's an N. In the quadrants, there's an N quadrant, and an A quadrant, N quadrant, and A quadrant. And in the middle of that, then, is an N and an A combined, and dit, da, and da, dit, come into, a, into, a, into one tone, just a buzz, you know, a hum. And if you get off on one side, you'd start hearing the N. If you get off the other side, you'd start hearing the A, so you could turn back and get on that on that heading then and, and of course you were had your compass so you were you were uh, kind of checking the the sound with the compass too and and you could fly in and then there, when you get over the the center of that you get a no and and you you know you're right over the center of it then and then you could fly out on on a pattern then fly out like a a minute or two minutes or something, and then, then turn 90 degrees another two minutes or something, and then back down four minutes, and then back, and then down. It should be in position to come into the runway. 
So who is the radio operator listening to that? Or you as a pilot? No, a or pilot, having a... pilot listened to that, yeah. Boy, that's pretty trick. I mean, that's pretty slick on how. So as long as you stay at a constant speed, so you come in and you're, okay, okay, there I'm center, I got the tone, and then the, the marks. And then, like you said, you go, you can go X out because you know that if you went two minutes out, then you have to come two minutes back mm -hmm. and around. So was it pretty accurate? Yeah, it worked, worked good, unless there was a lot of wind or something to blow you around. But then, it, but it didn't make much difference when you were coming in. But after you left it, left the range, and then got on your pattern, then if there was a lot of wind, side wind or something, it might blow you a little bit off. But but then you get back over to where you where you're ready to go down into your glide path onto the runway. Then then you could check on that beeper that's that's there and then check on this instrument you had in there that was lined up with the runway. So it, it worked out good. I like the flares. Yeah, <laughs> now that was kind of a nice sight to see. <laughs> and were the runways huge that you had a little bit of leeway? or? or... Well, they aren't too wide, but they're, they were fairly long, you know. So you had, you had some leeway as you didn't have to land right on the end of the runway to make it you could land up a little ways and still stop. So as long as you kept her somewhat in center, you bet. Yeah. Wow. What, so what type of range, when you talk about fog, because I've seen London in the fog, I mean, are you, you're talking about finding some pretty dense fog. Then. Oh, yeah. yeah. It looked like sometime it come rolling in, it looked like this rolls of cotton, you know, coming in. It was heavy. So how far, when, when you would come back, are you gapped out pretty good? Uh, plane to plane, or, or yeah, when you come over, you come over like in a formation, but then they start peeling off, and and so by the time you uh, you maybe a thirty seconds or something like that, maybe between between planes. Wow, that's still yeah. pretty close. I mean, really, thirty yeah, seconds is yeah, it's pretty close. But and after a ten-hour mission. How much fuel do you have left to... Well, there isn't a whole lot left, no. So you don't want to make a three passes. You want no, to make it yeah, in one you pass. Yeah, you have to make it in one. But sometimes they come in pretty dry, but usually that, usually you don't have that long a mission, but usually it's you know much shorter but, than it was. But, but then uh, <clears throat> when we... Later in the war, this was in 1944, and <clears throat> we'd already had the landing at, at the beaches there, you know, and we're working inland, so we had farther to go to hit the targets all the time as they kept moving in. Did you venture around London all, or England at all while you were there? I mean, well, did... I went there. Just about once, I think, and after I'd been there for a couple of three weeks or something like that, we had a leave to go in, and it was it was interesting seeing Piccadilly Circus and all that stuff. <laughs> That's the interesting part because a lot of these kids that joined the service had never been out of wherever Toledo or Tonino or Eatonville or. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing the world. They're, yeah. they're they're facing a war, but then you hear them also talk about these little kind of tourist excursions off the side. Anyway, but there was a war going on. But yeah. there was kind of like your flights where there was nothing, 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 action, nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, were you married at the time? No. Uh -uh. Girlfriend back home or anything? That... No, not really. And I, I uh, didn't meet my wife till I got back and... Actually, I was in the convalescent hospital and going around with a one leg in a cast, but I met her. <laughs> so was she a, a nurse at the... No, she was a friend of the family. My, uh, I was in the hospital down in Santa Ana, where it was pre-flight where I went through, but then they turned it into a convalescent hospital after the things got going some there. And I, so I went back there for... Uh, well, I, I had to have an operation there. They, they uh, took the 
chips out of my hip and put into my tibia. And, and so I had to be in a cast then for several months, I think it was. You know. But I could walk around I went on crutches. I, you know. But my folks came down to see me then from Tacoma. And we had a, some friends in uh, San Diego, so we went down to see them when I met my, met my wife then. And so I spent a lot of time on the train between San, <laughs> between San Diego and uh, the convalescent hospital and spent more time down there than I did in the hospital for a while, I think. <laughs> I guess that was the good part of the war. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. Uh -huh. Wow. So you went, you went to your pre-flight there, and you went to your post-flight there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. wow. yeah. We flew our planes over too. Uh, I didn't mention that, but we flew from Lincoln, Nebraska, and went up into into. Uh, New Hampshire, I think it was, and landed at Grenier Field, I think, in somewhere there. And, and uh, that's where we had a football game or something, and my engineer got something, he sprained something, but, <laughs> so he had to go into the hospital there. And, and uh, so we didn't pick him up until after we got to England, they didn't back to our base, and he came back and joined our crew again then. But then we flew up into uh, Labrador, I think it was. And so did you fly over short then, with, without your, your engineer? You know, we had a, they put on a, a replacement for us then. Oh, okay. But we flew to, I think with Labrador, and then to Iceland and then down into Wales and and we actually were just kind of ferrying the plane over I think because we dropped the plane off then in in uh, Wales and in uh, it's a big depot there and we, then we uh, were assigned uh, to uh, different groups and shipped over to our group and then we picked up the planes they had there then we so the one you were flying over, was that a brand new one? Yeah, a brand new one. Yeah. Huh. yeah. That's the other thing that amazes me is, I mean, just flying amazes me. But so here they give these young kids a plane and they say, yeah, yeah, here, fly this over to wherever. And, you know, never been there. You don't know where you're going. You're following your charts and all that. Mm -hmm. They all ended up supposedly where they were supposed to end up. And yeah. People keeping track of which plane and who got what plane and when it went where and which crew went where. And, a lot of logistics in that, isn't there? That's the amazing thing. Andy Rooney wrote a book, and, and he was saying that for every one, I think the numbers I have are right, for every one person on the front line, there were seven people it took to get them there. Yeah, could be, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, there aren't too many that get up where the actual shooting is, I don't think. You know. That's what Andy Rooney was saying, why some people, when they came back, didn't talk about their service because they said, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything. I wasn't on the front line, I wasn't all this, but, you know, they got the tanks that were supposed to be there, they got the ammo, the food, the fuel, the yeah. everything else. Yeah, it takes a big effort on everybody's part to do it. If we hadn't have done that, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have succeeded, mm -hmm. you know, as the Germans discovered, you know, when they got some of their people up and didn't have fuel to them. And yeah. Tanks were parked. Yeah, they couldn't fly the, fly the planes very often, they had to have this really pick and choose when they when they used their planes because they did, didn't have enough fuel to fly them all the time. That's you look at America building their planes <coughs> and shipping their planes. And, yeah. You know, I met your Boeing there. Yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah he built a good airplane. I'm not sure if Boeing built the ones I flew or that they were all Boeing planes, but I don't know if they were actually built by Boeing or consolidated or one of those, you know. But yeah, that was an amazing thing. There were being, so many being built by different people. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, and like you said, ha you, you look at just a, a little change in history, had the Germans had more of their rockets. Yeah, if they had those, uh, had those planes, uh, the, like they had the ME-262 was a twin-engine jet, if they'd had that a year or two earlier, it would have made a big difference in the war, I think. Because they would fly a lot faster than any of our fighters. And they could just fly rings around them practically, you know. But the 51 was really a good fighter, though. It was, it was where they could uh, have enough fuel with their wing tanks and things to escort us in and out, which, they, which was great, you know, and they couldn't do that before. The 47s or the 38s couldn't do it. And the Spitfires were a good plane for the British, too, but they were short-range, too. And you, and you needed that, because if I understand right, again, you got to a certain place, and you were just supposed to yeah, keep your plane there, so protect us as long as you can. Mm -hmm. Let us go do our thing, and then... Yeah, yeah, that's the way it was. We didn't expect them to fly through the flak with us, because there, there wasn't much point of it anyway, because they were, uh, their German fighters weren't flying through it much anyway, either, either you know. So. Yeah, those little guys can't quite take the flak that the uh, yeah. big birds can. Yeah, they look pretty good. They'd always... Be over us, you know, fire the S's to <laughs> keep slow enough to keep up with us. <laughs> they look pretty good up there, though. You ever make any ice cream in your plane? No, I've heard a couple people talk about they go no. up the. No, uh, take it up and uh, take, a, they take a garbage pail up with them and they'd go up to 30,000, whatever, and let it cool yeah, down a little bit, cold, make some yeah, ice cream. Yeah. And, yeah, you could do it probably, all right. Yeah, they said it was some of the most expensive ice cream the government made. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, thank you. Let me get you.